you so much. Pastor Jeff has gotten old and he's coming now to preach. So where are you at, Pastor Jeff? Where'd you go? Hey, there he is. There I am. I need your mic. I need your mic. Oh, I need that. Thank you. Never can have too many microphones, especially when he has one. Now I have them both. <laughs> well, good morning. It's good to see all of you. I don't know if you knew that we declared September, show up September, and I'm glad that you guys showed up today. The whole idea of us doing show up to September is uh, that we would all make a point in the month of September. You know, we're kind of getting back into routines with school starting to say, church is important, our relationship with God is important, our connecting with people in the body of Christ is important. Let's make it a point to all of us show up every Sunday that we can. And so I'm glad that you did today. And how many of you would say today that you would make it a point, make it a, a real effort, because I know that it's not the case that we are all here every Sunday. If we were all here on a Sunday that called New Hope their home, we wouldn't have enough seats for everybody to sit. How many would like to be part of seeing that happen? And you would say, I'm going to commit the next four weeks to be in here every Sunday. Okay? I, I'm, I'm begging you to raise your hand and saying, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an effort, a real effort, and say this is something that's important and valuable. Um, people need you. People need you to be here. You don't know who uh, may need you on a particular day. We had a, it was a Sunday about four weeks ago. Louise Stromberg was sitting back here, and she normally sits with a group of people. It's in the early service. And uh, there was somebody sitting in, uh, some family that was sitting with the people that she normally sits with. So she, she moved up a row. And she sat next to a guy. It was his first Sunday here. She came to the altar. She, he asked for her to come and pray with, with him came to the altar, she's made a connection there, a relationship, and uh, it's, it's amazing because that has grown into a relationship with a bunch of other people as a result of that connection. And you just don't know who needs you to be there and who you might need to be sitting there. So make sure that you're here every Sunday. You can even move a, move a row ahead or behind and you never know what'll happen. But today, here's the thing. Today in Show Up September, our theme is family and it's appropriate because today is Grandparents Day. How many of you knew that? How many, how many knew that today was Grandparents Day? It is Grandparents Day. If you're a grandparent, stand on up. Let's, let's recognize all of you grandparents. It's a great day to be a grandparent. Look at this. Congratulations. It, it, is, uh, it is a privilege and an honor to be a grandparent. And I don't know if you got that picture of a little guy that made uh, my wife and I a grandparent nearly two years ago. This is Barrett with his Nana. This, if you don't know Jeannie, Jeannie's my wife sitting right here. Jeannie, you want to stand up? She's, she's the beautiful side of me. And um, this is our little grandson, Barrett, who will be two next month. And uh, his mom and dad are expecting another one in November. And we're really excited to have another, another uh, hill in our family. So I'm, I'm glad to be a grandparent today, the greatest thing ever. So um, I just want to do something fun since it's Grandparents Day and we're just talking about family and just to uh, just kind of have a little, little, uh, little rivalry here and just have a little fun for you. Uh, I want to do a challenge between the generations. We're just calling it the Generation Challenge. And so I need two volunteers, one who would be part of the Gen Z crowd, which would be, you know, we were born after 1996. If we got a volunteer that would just come right on up here, that's you. Okay, we got someone coming right back here. Okay, and uh, I need someone from the baby boomer generation that would be like 1946 to 1964. I need a volunteer. Who's coming to do that? John, you coming? All right, look at this. We got it. Very, very good. Give him a hand. And what is your name? I'm Dylan. Dylan. Yep. Very good, Dylan. And, and how old are you, Dylan? I'm 20. 20, so you fit, right? Yeah. Yeah. That would be, I'm doing math in my head right now. You were born in 1999. Very good. Yeah, see, I, I still got a little bit of it. And this is John Crookshank. You guys know John. He's our, uh, he's our food bank guy that kind of kind of uh, directs all of that. John, why don't you kind of stand over here so these okay. people can see you over here. And uh, we're going to just do something a little fun. I'm going to put you guys on the spot here, and I'm going to give you some, some terms that maybe you don't know John from her generation, Delenn's generation. And Delenn, you might not really know, but uh, we're going to put you on the spot and see what you know about his generation. We've got lots of generations that, are, that worship here together. 
we have a multi-generational church. So uh, this should be a little bit of fun. And I'm going to put John on the spot first since he's a little more uh, mature here in age. Uh, and since more. it says baby boomer, that's him. And so I've got, a, I've got a couple of terms that I want you to see if you can define for me uh, from the uh, Gen, Gen Z generation. And then a few pictures that maybe you could identify for them. Okay. So Glenn's going to kind of help us out here to, to uh, um, kind of figure that out. If you keep the microphone right up to your mouth when you talk. Okay, John, here we go. First, first word, slaps. John, this is, this is a Gen Z term. Okay, just raise your hand if you, know, if you know what we're talking about when you say slaps. Okay? All right. Okay, John, you slap. know what slap means, right? I know what a regular slap is. What a regular slap is. So you want to go ahead and do that to me right now? <laughs> All right. Slaps. Uh, ge- it's a new term kind of for this, this generation. What, what do you I think it means? Heard. What's that? I haven't heard slap. You want to take a wild guess? Uh, dancing? No, it's not dancing. <laughs> Delin, do you know the term slaps? I've actually never heard that. She's actually never heard this. <laughs> Maybe that's <laughs> a Pastor Hill term. You know what? I didn't know either. Somebody had to tell me. But slaps. Um, So how many of you got a a grandma that makes really good food? Okay, maybe she bakes good pies or something. You say her pie really slaps. So it's food. Is that right? Am I right? Okay, good. Grandma's pie really slaps. Grandma's pie slaps. Okay, all right. So we don't, neither one of us get a point here. Oh, all kinds of hands were raised that know that. Raise your hand if you knew that ahead of time, slaps. I think Pastor Jeff made it up. See, we've got a multi-generational church here. Just because you don't know it. Hey, I've got a term. This is, this is maybe a term for, for John's generation, but when we say chrome dome. <laughs> uh, we all know what chrome dome is. Uh, I, was, I wasn't going to use that, but I, it came out anyways. That's what happens. All right, John, uh, we're, we're zero points right now, but the next word is yeet. <laughs> yeet. I'm You've sorry. heard lots of people say the word yeet, right? Uh, well, How many have you heard use eat, that? Term? But not eat. Yeet. Yeah. <laughs> My grandpa would say eat, but he'd mean like you want to eat. Uh, and it doesn't heard mean eat. that. I guess I need to hang out with the kids more. Yeah. Yeah. Delin, you know eat? Yeah. So okay. Can you define eat for us? So like, hold, my, hold it up to hold, hold the mic up. So my friends and I all the time, if we're like really excited, we're going to go somewhere, we're like, yeet, yeet. What's good? <laughs> It, we're going out to yeet. It, it really is a word that doesn't really mean anything. It's kind of like an exclamation. It's like you're just saying exclamation. You know, it's like, yes, it's, it's like the exclamation yeet, at the end I of whatever it is. We're excited. Okay. All right, John, you're over two so far. Let's, let's show you a couple of pictures. It's okay. It's okay. You know, it's okay. I'm yeah. good. There, we're not, we're not earning. This is a learning experience. There we go. You might be able to see this up here. This is, this is something that Delenn's generation would know. And, and maybe you do or don't. And there's a bigger picture right behind you. You know what that is? Uh, uh, a cooler? A cooler. <laughs> That's a good try. That, that is a good try. It, oh, it, is, it, is, it, it, is it like uh, AirPods? AirPods! <laughs> hey, good job, huh? Yeah. Very nice job. You did score one. That's very good. All on your own. I didn't even have to give that to you. All right, next picture. Tennis shoe. That is a tennis shoe, but it's a certain kind of tennis shoe that, uh, that most people, uh, younger generation, would know what they are. Uh, it has a certain ni- name. Is it a Nike Air? That's not a Nike Air. Mm. One of those three hundred dollars shoes. Uh, this sure is which, more. Yeah, I was reading the Wall Street Journal Actually, yesterday, this, and they had about a hundred different kinds of shoes. This shoe so. probably could sell for a thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah. Am I right? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. I'm Several sure hundred dollars. It's not dollars. a Reebok. But. Okay, it's not a Reebok either, but it is made by Adidas. And what kind of? What kind of? Do you know what this kind of shoe is? It looks like Yeezys. Oh, hold up. They look like Yeezys to me. Is it a Yeezy? Those are Yeezys. Yeah. Shoes Easy. that are worth a lot of money. Yeah, it takes a lot of. A lot it was of, in the Wall Street Journal yesterday. But. To buy that. Okay. All right. One more picture. Oh, that's virtual reality. Virtual reality. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna that's, take guy. <laughs> that's good. John, you got two. That's very good. That's, we're gonna put the pressure on Delenn here. Now she's 20, so she's she's got lots of smarts here. We you, love everybody at New You've Hope. been around a little bit longer than some of the younger people in your generation, but we've got a few words and some pictures for you from John's, John's generation. The first one is this. Booking. 
Yeah. Do you know what booking means? No. No. You know how to read? It has nothing to do with that. No, no. it's not that. It's not I, that. I, I don't know. John, do you know what booking means? We're booking out of here. Yeah, what does that mean? R- right, yeah. I, it means leave. I'm leaving. I'm after, getting out I'm, of here. And I'm going after, fast. We're booking after Chet. Good try, though. Good try. Okay. All right. Two. You, you, you lost your first one, but here we go. One more word. Smoky. Now, I mean, smoky could be a lot of things, but this is a particular profession. Who would you say would be a smoky? A firefighter. It would make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah. But it's not. I mean, <laughs> yeah. John, do you know what a smoky is? Well, a smoky barbecue? <laughs> this is, a, it would be a profession. A profession? Well, smoky the bear. S- smoky the bear. <laughs> Tell me what smoky, you guys know what smo- a smoky? A police officer, a highway patrolman. Yeah, okay, okay, oh, yeah. Okay. Smokey and the Bandit, you remember that movie? Yeah. Where I come from, we don't call them Smokies, we call them pigs. Oh. We, 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 uh, we love our law enforcement people. Sorry that I even brought this up. Sorry that I brought this up. We All got right, some first picture here. I want to see if you know what this is. You might have to look at the bigger picture. This is from John's generation. John knows exactly what this is, that and I haven't, even, I haven't even clued him in. I can give you a clue. That looks like a cassette <laughs> well, we, player or it, a CB radio. It looks like a cassette player or a CB radio. That would be, it would be a piece of equipment, yes, but it's neither Otherwise, one of those. Otherwise, I'm going to say it's a VCR tape recorder. It, it could starts with an eight. Starts with an eight. An eight? Yeah. Oh. Right, we're going way back. What is it, John? Eight track player. It's an eight track player. How many of you remember they're, eight track? They're, eight they're track. Huge. Oh yeah, love those eight tracks. You know, four different programs, and it fades out in the middle of your song, and then clicks and goes to the next. How many of you remember that? Okay. Yes. Find so glad we graduated too. from eight track. All right. Next picture. This is this is something I know, and I haven't even given John the picture, but I know he knows what this is. It's okay. This is an educational experience for all of us today. Do you have any guesses or clues? I have absolutely no idea what that is. No idea what that is. It's a tool. It's a tool, yes. It's a tool in school. Actually, what that little circle thing is on there is actually an eraser, believe it or not. But what it would be a, an eraser specifically for, John? It's for erasing, and there's a little brush you brush off the crystal. And what, 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 what would you use it for? What, what tool do you use it with? A pencil. A pencil. Or a pen. Some of them are I think it's a typewriter eraser. Yeah, and yeah. you can clear out the typewriter. Yep, yeah. yep. And it gets out the crumbs. It gets all the crumbs out because you don't want all the crumbs falling down in your typewriter. So. And then your typewriter doesn't work. At least there you I go. know what a typewriter is. You do know what a typewriter is. I do know what a typewriter is. I didn't put a picture of a typewriter. <laughs> okay, one more picture. One more picture. This isn't a typewriter either. Probably gonna get this wrong. Just, but just a guess. It's like it's like one of those radios. Like I don't know. Like I'm thinking of Titanic when I we see it. We put John on like, the spot earlier. SOS, so. like, <laughs> Titanic SOS thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. it's 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 and, not and, that. John, you know what this is? Yeah, it's a it's a real to real movie. Projector. It's a it's a movie player actually. A video yeah. projector. And, it, and that was a hard one because it doesn't have the reels on it. You know, yeah, it if it had the reels, it, the it would make a lot I more sense. But back in school, we used to have audio visual clubs, and you were a special person if you could run that. Every that classroom video had one. Yeah, video that's, video yeah. Hey, would you guys give these guys a hand? You did a great job. It was fun. Thank you. Great job. Thanks, John. Thanks. Just a little fun, I think, just kind of highlight. You know, the re- reality is, is that we're a lot different. But uh, those kind of differences, and just because we can't speak each other's language, we have something in common, and the, what we have in common here is our faith in Jesus Christ. We gather here, whether we know what a video projector or a reel-to-reel projector or Yeezys or virtual reality or whatever it might be, um, we may not be able to speak everything in each other's language, but what we speak is the language of love, the language of hope, the language of faith, and that's Jesus Christ. And that's what unites us all together here, no matter what generation we're from. And I love the fact that we have a multi-generation church where uh, I look out and I see all ages. And we're all here worshiping together. We do what we do here on purpose so that we can appeal to an entire family. We have families where generations are here worshiping together. And I value that greatly because we have so much to offer each other. 
as it's grandparents day today i want to focus on this topic on family of legacy and i understand legacy is a is a word or a term that we often use when somebody passes away and it was such a shock yesterday to hear that um, elmer had passed away and instantly i start thinking about you know what does elmer leave behind elmer leaves behind quite a legacy he leaves behind a wife a family he leaves behind uh, so many lives that he's impacted because he's got a long history of involvement with Awanas and spent a lot of time with kids teaching scripture and building a a spiritual foundation in in so many kids' lives. Elmer took trips every year to South Korea and spent weeks there at a time. And uh, on Facebook, I noticed that there were a lot of people commenting from from Korea talking about what what an impact he had made in their lives. You know, and I I found myself, I woke up this morning in the middle of the night laying in bed and I'm thinking, you know what, I'm just a breath away from the same thing. Any one of us. It's like Elmer didn't have a clue yesterday that would be the last day he would live on this earth. None of us have a guarantee. And so it really does matter what we do and how we live. It matters that we're living ready for that event to happen at any moment. But legacy is... is, uh, it's what we leave behind. It's, it's handing down something from, from, from the past to a future generation, uh, from an ancestor or predecessor uh, moving something forward. It could be money, it could be personal property. But what I want to look at legacy is the part that, that is the full body of work that's your life. What your life represents, handing down to the next generation. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 12. In Corinthians, Paul uh, chapter 12 is talking about spiritual gifts and he's talking about the church as a whole and he's talking about how in a church there's a lot of different parts and we all do different things and we all have different gifts and we all have different abilities, but we all work together as one to be the church, to be a body. And it takes all these different parts and all these different gifts, but we're, we're a church. Um, in verse 29, he says, are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in an unknown language? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. But now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. And he moves into chapter 13, which we've just spent time in 1 Corinthians the last few weeks and months. And um, so... 1 Corinthians, you're, you're well aware of, is the chapter that talks about love. And, and this is how he starts out chapter 13. He says, if I could speak the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I'd have nothing. Look, you can have all the money and you can pass all the money down that you want to. You can have accumulated all the things and pass all that down. But he's saying, look, I could do all of that, but if I don't love, I have nothing. And I really don't have much to push forward. Go down to the end of chapter 3 after he talks about what love is and what love isn't. Verse 13, the last verse of chapter 13, he says this, three things will last forever. Your version maybe says, now these three remain, or these three abide. These three things last forever, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. What we want to invest in is something that's going to last forever. And I think Paul is telling us here what we need to invest in and what we need to, to work toward, and that is faith, hope, and love. Our lives, our lives, the the words that we speak, the attitudes that we have, our actions, our lives, our faith, our hope, our love is something that we can use to leave an enduring, uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Inheritance, a legacy to the next generation. Those are things that we can pass on. Those are things that, as Pastor Weaver always says, things that money can't buy and death can't take away. Those are things that will last forever. You ever wondered someday when I'm long gone, what are my kids, what are my grandkids going to say, this is what my 
my mom or my dad or my grandparent left me, and it's still impacting my life today. A lot of us have grandparents that we've lost or parents that we've lost. And we realize that they have left something behind for us. What will they say when you're gone? More than a bank account, more than an insurance policy, an investment, or a home. We know those are material things that will all be burnt up or stolen or it, it, it'll just fade away. But ask yourself, what am I already leaving behind that's making a lasting impact on the generations to come? You have children, you have grandchildren, you have other people that you have invested in or you're, you're wanting to make a difference in their lives. What am I already doing? Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said this. He was a, a theologian, a pastor in Germany during the time of the, of the Nazis. He was an anti-Nazi person. He said this, a righteous man is one who lives for the next generation. A righteous man is one who lives for the next generation. The reality is we live in a world today that we're living for ourselves. The vast majority of our world is living for self. But he says a, a true righteous person is one who lives for the next generation. We see in scripture this mindset that God has always been for passing these things along, passing truth on from generation to generation. Psalm 71, 18 says, even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Psalm 78, 4, we will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. Psalm 145, 4, let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts and let them proclaim your power. See, Paul had invested in, a, in one of his disciples named Timothy and and that's the outlook that he had when he told Timothy this in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. He said, hold on to the pattern of the wholesome teaching that you have learned from me. Hold on to those things. The value, the, the, the wholesome teaching that I've passed on to you, that's something that you hold on to. A pattern shaped by the faith and love that you have in Christ Jesus. Through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully guard this precious truth that has been entrusted to you. And as Christian families, we're entrusted with this priceless treasure. God wants us to faithfully pass on through our life, through our words, to leave a lasting legacy of righteousness. It's his design from the beginning for families uh, to pass on this heritage to the next generation. It's up to us as grandparents, as parents, uh, to, to do this. And when that doesn't happen, when we don't pass those values and those standards and righteousness on, what we're left with is uh, our, parent, our kids may adopt the, the religion of their parents, but they're going to fail to follow the God of their parents. We'll have religious kids. I read an article a few weeks ago that said that the average churchgoer in the United States attends church one and a half times per month. One and a half times per month, and I'm thinking that's almost half until I do the math and realize one and a half times a month is 18 times in a year. The average regular churchgoer now is 18 times in a year. I don't know what your patterns are, and not that church attendance, and we don't, we don't keep records of you being here, and we don't give awards for perfect attendance or anything like that, but it's valuable that we make gathering together with our church family uh, a regular part of our, of our activity. If we're only showing up for church once every three weeks, something's going to end up missing in your children's, in your children's box. There's something in their teaching and in their learning that's going to end up missing. You might have learned all of this, but, and you might be fine, but your children are going to miss out. And so when you stop to think about what they would learn by being here every week, it's, the, the reality is, is unless we're purposeful and intentional and consistent in our children's spiritual education and formation, it won't happen. They won't get these beliefs and these values. It's, it'll drastically affect how they live their lives out from this point on. More important than just passing on beliefs, we as parents have to, have to model what it means 
to be a passionate follower of Jesus? Are we modeling that for them? Do they see us worship God with our life, meaning his spirit and his, his word and everything, it just permeates who we are. And it's not just what we do at church and then we do this outside of church. I hope and pray that all of us, this would be our, our goal, our, our motive is that God so fills and permeates our life that we're the same person here that we are at work, that we are at home or wherever we go. I hope that if you see me out in public, you're going to say, that's exactly what I expect Pastor Jeff to be doing, uh, to, to be saying, um, to be part of. I hope that I wouldn't be doing something you go, that's my pastor doing that? Nor do I want to say that about you either. I'm not being critical or judgmental, but here's the deal. I'm not just a Christian in church. Being a Christian is, is, is who I am to the core. And so I need to live that out and model that for my kids. I can't be somebody here in the pulpit. Um, Ethan, my, my son, he'll know when I'm home that I'm being somebody, that I'm, I'm being a total fake and I'm being a total religious person if what I'm saying here isn't what I'm doing at home, right? He knows that. Our kids are smart. But if we're not engaged and we're not modeling for them what it means to be a follower of Christ and to, to worship him with all of our life and to understand our purpose in this life and to possess a hope that goes far beyond anything that this world can give us, then we're missing out on passing that kind of legacy uh, to our children. But if we do that, we can say confidently, like, like Paul said to Timothy, he said this in, in 2 Timothy 3.10, he says, you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. You know my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance. And that's what I want for us as parents and grandparents to be able to say to our kids, you know exactly what I stand for. You know exactly who I am. That's, and, and, and you need to take that, apply that, work that into your life, be an example. You see, um, the, the Boy Scouts have this rule. Always leave the campground cleaner than you found it. How many Boy Scouts do we have in the room? Okay, you've heard that before? Is that true, Carter? Have you heard that before? Okay. Always leave the campground cleaner than you found it, meaning you show up in the campground and regardless of, you know, who, who put whatever there, you're going to pick it up and make it cleaner. You're going to clean up the mess. This is what, this is what happens in my house sometimes. I'll see a, an empty water bottle sitting on a table, just sitting there with a lid on side of, beside, beside the bottle on the table, and I'll say, um, all right, whose water bottle? And I'll, and I'll hear, not mine. And, wh and what they're saying is, I didn't do that, and I don't have to clean it up because it wasn't me that did it. Okay, the reality is, is somebody's going to clean it up. Let's do our best to, to, to leave the campground cleaner than we found it. Intentionally improve the environment for the next group of campers. That's the whole idea. Leave it better than I found it for the next people to come along. The original form of that rule by the, the father of scouting, Robert Powell, he said this, try and leave this world a little better than you found it. Try and leave this world a little, little better, or er, er, little better than you found it. Make, you heard me say that, didn't you? Litter better than, yeah. It's one of our God-created motives. This is, this is what is recorded in Genesis chapter 1. God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern. We were made to multiply, not just biologically. We were made for the kingdom of God, for our lives to be multiplied beyond ourselves. We are to multiply ourselves into people who come behind us. That something should be set in motion as a result of our lives to made to leave this world a better place than we found it's 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 called legacy that's what it's called it's living beyond ourselves and it's the title of the message this morning which i haven't even s spoken yet but it's you leave what you live you leave behind what you li live elmer neusendorfer leaves behind what he lived elmer would do anything for anybody he wasn't even here at this church for a week or two and he's cooking meals for people that's what he does. 
And he'd just do that for anybody. And, and, and his, his legacy lives on, and there's going to be somebody who needs to step into his place to serve like he served. To live beyond ourselves requires a God who is beyond ourselves. And in the world that we live in, the culture that's dominated by me, that's tough. You see, the reality is a lot of people fashion God after their own image, after their own standards, their own worldviews, instead of understanding themselves and our world through God's. The reality is we live in a, a present-minded society. We live in a, in, a, in a social media culture that is all about what's happening now. We live by facebook and instagram and we're seeing what's going on right now we've got news feeds that are coming in as something happens we've got it yesterday if you're a football fan i i got um i've got notifications about antonio brown like all through the stinking day i don't even know him or or like him or care about him but my phone is being loaded up on news about antonio brown he's a terrible player i mean he's caused all kinds of problems he signed with one team Earlier in the day, they said, okay, everything's okay. He's going to start on Monday. Then I got this notification he's been dropped by the team. And then there's this list of who, te what teams might be interested in him. And then like two hours later, a team signed him. So all in one day, he lost a job, gained a job, and now he's playing for another team. I don't care. But see, I know all of this stuff. Because we're in this news cycle that's constantly happening. And we got all this news of what happened yesterday, and we forget what happened the day before. We don't even know. There was some big news events that happened a week ago, and most of us probably couldn't even tell you what it was. Some disaster. It's the reality. We live in this very right now world. It's, it's a present-minded world. We lose touch with where we come from because we're so involved in what's happening right now. We don't think about legacy. We don't think about what's been handed to us and what we're doing to pass a legacy on to the people uh, that come after us. And if we're not acknowledging that we, that we inherited a legacy, whether it's good or bad, then we won't see the value of leaving a legacy to somebody else because we're so involved in right now. It's the culture that we live in and it's a, it, it's a problem. We're a society that wants to live forever. We idolize the youth culture. And the reality is, is most of us are always doing what we can to make ourselves younger. We'll hide behind makeup or things that take the wrinkles out from under our eyes. All these commercials that I see on TV, taking the wrinkles out from under your eyes. You got bags and all of a sudden, now I look like I'm 20 years old. The clothes that we wear, the things that we do, we're always trying to, to, to be younger, to look younger, to act younger than what we really are. And what we're doing is we're, we're, we're hiding behind the fact that we all are getting older. It doesn't change anything. We're a day closer to the end than we were yesterday. I, I'm 52 years old. I still feel young. I feel like I'm 30, feel like I'm 35. But the reality is I'm 52 years old and I'm more over the hill than I want to realize that I, that I am. And I understand some of you are saying you're really young. And then there's some of you saying you're really old. I didn't know you were 52. But the reality is, is I have more behind me than I probably have in front of me. I probably won't live 52 more years. I may not even live another day. I, when I woke up last night and I'm laying in the bed thinking, I could take my last breath here and this would be it. How my world would change or my family's world would change or if something happened to someone in my family and it, we're not guaranteed that. We, we lose sight of the fact that we're getting older and we need to be working toward the future. We live as if we're always going to be here. and We deny the inevitability of death. And what we become is less motivated to live in out our legacy. We also live in a disposable society. Everything is designed to be used a few times and then it's discarded. How, how often do we see this? Things just aren't made like they used to be. It's a throwaway society. Technology, as soon as we buy a piece of technology, it's outdated. We're, we're changing these things. $900,000 phones every two years. You remember one of the pictures I was going to have is a rotary phone, and I think a lot of our younger generation may look at that and go, I know that's a phone. But do you realize we still use terms like hang up the phone? We don't hang anything up. We just push a button. Phones, I mean, we pay $1,000 every We used to have a phone, and we had the same phone at our house forever. It was a great thing when we got this 25-foot-long curly cord that went under, because we could go about anywhere in the house that we wanted to. That was upgrading. That was a major upgrade. We didn't throw phones away. 
I got, I got so many phones at my house, I don't know what to do with them. They're just in a Ziploc bag waiting for resurrection. I don't know. <laughs> I, I bought a grill last week. I, bought, I, I have a grill that I'd had for a five or six years, and this grill, uh, the inside started falling apart. The burners, the, the grates, the heat tents, and the pan underneath. And I priced all the parts out for this grill, and it would cost me more to buy the parts to fix up the old grill than just to go buy the new grill. And I end up buying the very same grill that I bought five or six years ago for less money than the parts. And, it just, and some of you are going, well, that sounds like a good deal. But I've got a, now I have two grills. I've got one old one that I don't know what to do with because it, does, it doesn't work. Everything's falling apart on it. I would have liked to just fix that up and, and conserve. But it's the world and the society, the culture that we live in, it's a disposable si- society, the culture. We throw everything away. And so in that mindset, what can we add to the world when it's going to be ab- obsolete anyway? The reality is, outside of all of that, there's something that lasts forever, faith, hope, and love. And we need to pass those things on to the generation that's coming behind us. We owe it to them, and we need to invest in them. The fourth thing is that we're an impatient society. We want things to happen immediately, and most things in our, in our culture do. We can, we can do whatever we want to almost in a moment. We can talk to somebody on the other side of the world. That used to be impossible unless you had lots and lots of money. I used to live, I lived in Polk City as a kid, and calling Des Moines was, was a free call for me, but I could call a friend that lived in Alleman that I went to school with, and that was a long distance call. I mean, it's the things that we can do instantaneously and we can do without even thinking about it, but um, when we live in this, in this instantaneous society, we become impatient, and the reality is if we're building into our legacy, it is a slow thing you probably are not going to see the impact or the results as you're living into your legacy that you're going to leave behind you. You probably won't see most of the effects of that and they won't won't probably take place until long after you're gone. But it's still worth living into. It's still worth investing in. When we're too impatient to put the effort to live beyond ourselves, what we're doing is we're, we're forgetting about our kids. So the underlying issues in our society, uh, there's cultural things like individualism. I define myself. I'm autonomous. I make my own decisions. Materialism, my possessions define me. Having things, having security, having possessions, all of that makes me satisfied. Consumerism is my personal benefit defines the worth of another person or thing. So I always ask, what do I get out of this? And we make those decisions based on what I get rather than what can I, how can I contribute to this? So it's the, the reality of the culture that we live in is fighting against us, leaving this kind of a legacy. These things dominate our culture and affect us all in some way, but if we're gonna live into our God-created legacy, we've got to multiply and cultivate a life beyond ourselves. And it takes a God that is beyond ourselves, and we've got to see God for who he is. We've got to submit to him. We've got to surrender to him, live according to his will and his plan, and realize I have, a, I have the ability to pour into my grandson. He's 23 months old. What do we do? We, we, today I was throwing him up in the air. He loved that, you know. We haven't had a deep conversation yet. But I'm working toward that. <laughs> you know, I want, him to, I want him to love being with his papa and being with his nana. And we're going to have those moments down the road. And I want to pour into him things that I hope I poured into my own kids. But even that doesn't stop. I don't stop being a dad and I don't stop being a grandpa. And there's going to be times that come and every little step is important along the way. The whole idea is being able to pass on something that has value, something that lasts beyond me, something that will last forever. Paul said these three three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. The word of God lasts forever. The grass fades, the flowers, uh, uh, you know, whatever that, they both die. But the word of the Lord lasts forever. Grass withers, flowers fade. The word of the Lord lasts forever. What are we investing in? The things that last forever. So regardless of your past or what was handed down to you, you can leave a lasting 
godly legacy. You say, well, I, I didn't have any of that handed down to me. Well, you know what? You can start and hand something down to the next generation. You don't have to say, because it wasn't given to me, I have nothing to give. Give your life to God. How seriously do you take your role of ensuring that your children and grandchildren are, have a Christ-centered inheritance coming? It's time to wake up. It's time to realize what are we investing in? What is our time, our energy, our efforts going toward? I can gain the whole world and lose my grandson. I could gain the whole world and lose my children. I could gain the whole world and lose my own soul. And then what do I have? The greatest legacy that's ever been handed down is that God so loved the world that he gave his son Jesus. He died on a cross, took your place, died for your sin. So that by believing in him, you'd have everlasting life. It's a legacy. God created us in his own image. He breathed his own breath into us. And then he bought us back. This morning, if you don't know a relationship with Jesus Christ, and you realize that what we're talking about, all this stuff that happens in the culture around us, that's always changing, always tough to keep up with, but there's something that lasts and that remains, and it's what we do with and for Jesus Christ. Give your life to Jesus today. It's as simple as he offered his life to you, and you just take him up on it. It's a free gift from God. And today, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus or you're living outside of his plan and his will and his purpose for your life, it's as simple as just saying, Jesus, come into my life and save me, help me, forgive me, give me new life. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? If that's you today and you're, you're not living for Jesus, trying to keep up with all the stuff that's going on or in the world, it just leaves you empty. And today you would say by raising your hand, Pastor Jeff, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to invite him in to forgive me of my sins. To pour his legacy into me so that I could pass it down to my family. If, you, if that's you, would you just raise your hand and, and raise it high? I believe there's people all over the room. Thank you. How many of you here today, you'd say, I've, I know Jesus, I've committed my life to him, but I've got to be honest that I get caught up in all of this in the moment stuff with what's going on in the world and the values of the world and it's so easy to get distracted and so easy to get onto other things and forget the fact that I'm, I'm a mortal human being and I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. And I need to be living into my legacy more than I've been doing. I need to be pouring into things that will last forever to my family, to the people around me. You're a follower of Jesus, but you're saying, I just need to live into that legacy more than I've been doing. And that's you. Just raise your hand today and say, I'm making a commitment today to live for my future to live for the future of my children and my grandchildren. There's some people here today and your kids are not living for God. They've walked away from him. And it breaks your heart. Here's the thing. You might not be able to change them, but you keep on keeping on doing the right things, pouring your heart out, your life for God, living that example day after day after day. Be the example. Live into that legacy so that someday, someday, you can see them return to that. Don't give up hope. Put your hope in God. These things last forever. Faith, hope, and love. Father, today, hands have been raised all across this room saying, Jesus, I need you. Those that are saying for the first time or maybe just coming to this place of realizing that they need to once again
commit their life to you. God, I pray that as they call out on your name, as they say, Jesus, forgive me and save me, that they would have the confidence of knowing that what you did on the cross, you did out of love. What you did on the cross, you did for them because you don't want their life to be lost and hopeless. You want them to live with life, hope, joy, peace. I pray that you'd pour your spirit, your presence into their life. Thank you, God, that we can live uh, with a, f- with a, with a f- future. And though things in our world are changing so much, though things in our world seem to be falling apart, though things in our world seem to be upside down, God, we know that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We can stand on your word and on your truth, and we can, and we can live for that truth and make a difference wherever we're at. Thank you for our families. Help us, God, to live into that legacy, to live for you, to purpose and determine, God, that we're going to live with our eyes fixed on you, following after your purpose and your plan every day of our life. We're going to do all that we can, God, to honor you, to serve you, to worship you. God, that we would commit to the people sitting around us to be there for them, to know who they are, to help them, to bless them, to encourage them, to support them, to love them. We're a family. We thank you for the family that you've blessed us with. Help us in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen.